We're 10 rounds down now. We're halfway. We've been to jolly old England for the British Grand Prix. And it's time for our race wrap. And we're going to cover everything as always. MotoGP, Moto2, Moto3, as well as other things that have happened in the meantime. News, rider moves, etc. Everything is chaptered below. Skip ahead to whatever you want to get to first. We're going to start in MotoGP this week. And let's start with, uh, it was our little heritage round thing, right? So all the bikes look fantastic. I was really happy with every single one. There was a few that didn't follow the brief, but just follow the brief. Vintage livery. Not everyone gave us that, but they still look good anyway. And the ideas behind some of them were still, I appreciate that. But it's by the by. It has nothing to do with the actual racing, does it? So, and let's actually start before the racing. Let's start with qualifying because there was a little bit of, I'll say controversy, but I mean, not really. You know, Peko having his say on the, rider towing and it's clearly directed straight at mark you know saying that you're the best riders in the world you don't should need a tow in qualifying yeah but look it's one of those things everyone's going to try and get every competitive advantage that they possibly can that's called elite sport i suppose within the rules but it also brings up stuff about like should the rule do we need to change the qualifying format or the rules i mean probably not that drastic of a situation but i guess the theory is that it could become a problem i was alive and watching motorsports, Formula One particularly, I think it was 2005 that we had the one-shot quality. Did they do it for one or two years? They didn't do it for very long. I loved it. I think it is the greatest qualifying format. For, I think they've been do, should have been doing that in Moto3 for years now because of the issues they have with these kids just stopping on the circuit and stuff like that. Just meh, one at a time. Off you go. Who's the best? Uh, no toe, no slipstream, nothing. No rider as your reference. Just it's you and the circuit. I think that's the ultimate qualifying. Like I said, it is literally just you, the circuit, one go at it. The quickest man will be on the front of the grid. There's no outside factors there. Now, obviously, where it can get dodgy is you could get an outside factor if it's a dodgy, rainy day or half rain, half not. Maybe it rains later in the day. It looked a bit unlucky. So that could mix the grid up in an unnatural way. But it's pretty rare, I think, that you'd get that. So I think it's worth the punt on that. I'd like to see it just because, like I said, it's my favorite qualifying form. I think it is the, the ultimate form of time trial, isn't it? Uh, but in saying that, I like I like the way it is now, the Q1, Q2 thing. I like that. I also like the current Formula One thing. I was a fan of that when it came in as well, um, just because of the way it keeps everyone on circuit. But I also used to, <laughs> I used to go to Phillip Island and sit there for an hour and watch just when it was just a qualifying, which is a one hour session. It was just a one hour session. Do what you want. And you used to sit there for 45 minutes while nothing happened. I didn't mind. Just go get a coffee or something, you know? But yeah, just my take on it. I'd like, just give them the old one shot. I don't mind that. One at a time. Off you go. And you just do the reverse order of where they finish in practice, you know? So quickest man goes last. But we started off the sprint race with a bit of a bang. Morbidelli just going flying. He, he does this sometimes. Went flying into the back of Bears. He just got it all wrong. There were suggestions here in the, at the time that it might have been a ride height issue or something like that. But because he got the penalty for the Sunday, I'm assuming that when they looked at it, there was no issue there. He just fucked up. Best year was good, wasn't he? He was so good. And he's, I don't think you'll ever, when you look at best year dominance, you'll never see it like he gets to the front and just absolutely hammers it like Peko or, you know, if you're looking back at like a stoner or something. I think if he was the best rider on the grid at the moment and he was winning every other week, that's how he'd be winning. There's no riding off at the front for him. That's just how it is. So this is him at his most dominant, where he can just like pick him off. And he's like, I know when to take my moment. I'm going to wait and wait and wait. And then when stuff starts to click for me, I come in and then I go past you and there's nothing you can do about it. But he was bloody good. Two two wins over the weekend for him. Is this a title tilt? I mean, can't fully rule him out just yet. I'd like to see him win another one and then we'll, we'll talk. I'm reluctant to say he's in the title fight just because of how good and consistent the other I'm mean, going to say consistent. They do have their bad days, don't they? I mean, we saw Peko in the sprint and we saw Martin in Germany. But generally, generally speaking, they're not going to give up enough points to let both of them to let him back in it, are they? Probably not. So is he in the title fight? Let me know what you think. I'm going to still say, well, I'm going to be reluctant to say yes, but I would love to see him enter that fight. I would love to see him be right in there come the business end. But we do know as well, we are... I mean, the flyaways, is Bestia better on the flyaways from memory? Is he is he good when you get to Asia and stuff? I think he is. One in Malaysia last year, didn't he? Maybe. Maybe it is on. Maybe it's on. We'll see. 
49 points down. Speaking of title fights, uh, Martin back into the lead. Nice recovery. Look, if you're going to get beat on the day, you're going to get beat on the day. But the best thing to do is just do what Martin's done this weekend. You've got to be second and extend your, and, well, take your title lead back. Very well done. Nice recovery. I was impressed with him this weekend. Despite the fact he didn't win, did almost everything else he could have done. To put the pressure back on Peko a little bit. Now, Peko did that thing where he crashes on the Saturday, right? And I was, straight away, I was like, he's winning tomorrow. Because he looked like at the time he was starting to catch back up to the leaders, wasn't he, in that sprint? And I could see him sort of getting on the podium and on the sprint podium and and maybe challenging later in the race uh, with the speed he was showing. So I thought there's one of those ones where Peko just turns up the next day and does a Peko thing and just goes and wins the race. And it was like, oh, what were we, what were we, what were, what were we worried, what were we worried about? My God, what were we worried about? Yeah, but I thought he would just turn up on Sunday and do his thing. Uh, it didn't quite happen for him. We go to Austria next. I mean, I can see him winning there. I absolutely can. He won't be too worried with that. Uh, the other main rider I want to talk about was Mark, because he did a Peko. Well, he did a Mark. Did he do a Peko or a Mark? But crashing the sprint. I mean, he's not seriously in the title fight, is he? I don't think. So it won't matter too much in the long run. But he had a decent Sunday. Got up to fourth. And I just think for him, on the 23 spec, Ducati, I think he's just going to have to sit there. Well, I think he is just sitting there going, look, what else do you want me to do? He's clearly the best 23 spec bike out there. I don't think, I think he's just going to sit there and go, look, I'm doing all I can. And he'll take that confidence into next year when he goes, well, if I'm on the same bike, maybe he'll get more out of it. So yeah, I don't think he'll be too worried. I, again, though, if he's not crashing as much as he is, he probably is a lot closer to this title fight, but is what it is. Now it was a good race. I thought we had three really good well, four good races this weekend. But in terms of Grand Prix, we had three really good races. I mean, KTM returned to form. I was impressed with Acosta just the way he scrapped. Aspargaro got himself up there, got himself into a scrap as well. Good on him. Digi scrapped hard. I like that. Just get out there and have a crack, lads, you know. So they all had decent results. Uh, but it was nice to see K KTM little return to form. And it's a shame with Binder that he had his issues off the line on Sunday because I thought he was probably quick enough to finish ahead of Pedro, uh, Pedro and Miller. You know, like I said, it was nice to see them at least get some of that form back heading into Austria. I think they'll be quick enough there. Um, we are expecting to see that kind of pace from them again. And we'll cover a few of the other guys later on. We've got a little, the All Japan Cup's coming later on. So we'll cover those guys in that. Now, a little bit of off-track housekeeping to get through. Digi signed a factory deal with Ducati. Now, this is one of the biggest turnarounds I think I've ever seen from a rider. He's got himself a, 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 a 25 spec bike for next season. So fair play. That makes him, as I see it now, are they going to run a fourth 25 spec bike? I don't think they are because will they give one to Alex Marquez, even though he's contracted to Grissini, he's not contracted to Ducati. So I'm thinking they're just not going to bother with that. Is Fermin going to get one as a factory contracted rider? Will they want to see him for a year before they just chuck him on a later spec bike? Which means are they only running three 25 spec bikes next season instead of four? They I think that's a very real possibility. But I think Fermin would be favourite to get one if, just because he's a Ducati contract, if they do run a fourth. So, yeah, that. Uh, but my point is that puts Digi third in line at Ducati. Yeah. He's third in line at Ducati. So whatever might happen next season and they think, well, we need to promote someone, he's next up. He's gone from eighth in line to third in about 12 months. <laughs> madness. Absolute madness. Latest talk, nothing confirmed yet. And I don't know how real this is, but, because we've been talking about Remy to Pramac, haven't we? With them testing him out here in these two last two Grand Prix, which I would have liked to see as an Australian. But we're hearing now Miller to Pramac, which is equally good for me because I just want to see one of them in there. Miller to Pramac, return to Pramac, but on a Yamaha this time. The way it's being spoken about in the last couple of days is like it's pretty much a done deal. So we'll see how that turns out. Tell me what you think of that one. Another one to Yamaha, Augusto Fernandez as a test rider. I think this makes sense. I can't see him getting himself another proper spot on the grid for next season so i think and then would you rather like if you're him would you rather try and get yourself a spot at superbikes is there any good spots at superbikes going maybe not this might be his best option but he's still young for this you know he's still young because i can't see once you go into that role seriously how realistic is that you get onto a world championship grid again superbikes or otherwise don't know uh, and the last one was somcat chantra to lcr i feel like this would just be a change for the sake of change there's a bit of boredom with Taka now, even though you know what you're getting. And Chantra probably won't do any better. I'm pretty confident he wouldn't do any better. This, for me, would just be a change for the sake of boredom. 
oh, tack is better. We, we can't just keep him forever, right? Let's get someone else in. And I doesn't want it. So I feel like Honda, as a conservative sort of Japanese company, I feel like they're sticking with Taka. Unless Itamitsu's really pushing to get a tie rider on it, perhaps. I don't know. But on pure motorcycling, I think I'd stick with Taka here, at least for one more year. Chantra's quick when he wants to be, but he just doesn't show up very often. So I don't see where the benefit is here. Again, like I said, other than for the sponsor. So perhaps. And that's it. It's time for the All Japan Cup. One of the favorite segments here on the race wrap. Chuck the results of the All Japan Cup on the screen now. And you won't be surprised to know that Fabio's won that. He came 11th in the race. He's had a couple of really good... I think he's 11th two races in a row. Very good. Fabio's the only one that can do anything with one of these Japanese bikes, apparently. Then we went Zarco, Taka, Marini, who's starting to find a bit more consistency and a little bit more speed to go with it. Uh, and finishing ahead of some other Japanese bikes sometimes, which is good for him. Then we had Remy, and then Mir was the sixth and last bike. The sixth and last Japanese bike we had there, and he DNF, so he didn't pick up any points this weekend. It now looks like this in the Old Japan Cup. Standings on the screen, please. Fabio is gone. It's over. 79 points. Just racks up a 10-pointer every week now. Uh, Zarko goes to, will stay second with 40 points. Taka stays third with 35. Luca Marini's the mover here. He goes to 27 points, tied with Alex Rins, who's obviously missing Grand Prix hand over fist. Mir's the struggler now. Now, while this is where this gets interesting, because when you look at the actual standings, Mir's got 13 points. He's doing all right. When you look at my little system here of doing things where everybody, the top six get points, and if you don't finish, you don't get any. Marini's, uh, Mir's not really picking up that many. He's got less than Marini now, because Marini just finished races, right? Uh, Remy goes to three, and Bradle's on three as well um, from his wild cards. I think the main takeaway from this is Marini's ahead of Mir. Do what you want with that information. Now it's time for Moto2. I've got it written down as Jixon here, but it's Jake Dixon. Big Jixo. I imagine if you were, like I said, all the three races were excellent this weekend, but I imagine if you're British, this would have been particularly exciting with the little last lap battle with a British rider winning the race. It was very gritty, I've got written down here. Don't know why I went with gritty, but gritty win for Jake Dixon because he maybe had to scrap a bit for it, I suppose. So that actually does him a world of good in the standings. He goes up to seventh. And interestingly, we, it was a very interesting podium. None of our riders on the podium, I think we had any, didn't have anyone from the top six in the championship on the podium. So it was Dixon, Kanet, and Vietti who after this weekend are now 7th, 8th, and ninth. So for them sort of guys, the championship run is over. So it's like, it's got to be like a prize fighter, don't you? Just can you win on the day? Can you just have a few few more big races before the end of the season just to put yourself out there? And maybe snatch one of these rides that's floating about. Fermin and Ayagura both had an absolute nightmare. Agura at least was at the front at some point. I'm thinking, is this a tyre thing? Did he just not manage well? Um, because he's ended up just scraping, what, a point? Two points, tough old day. And he's fallen 18 points behind Sergio Garcia in the championship fight. Sergio Garcia, I mean, he was very good because he dropped outside the top 20, I want to say, at some point in this race and ended up fourth. And he's very solid. Whilst he's lost a bit of that outright pace that had him winning races and finishing on the podium, he's still racking up consistent points here, which if you're in a bit of a slump, just at least do that. Don't have the big blowout. Like don't have don't have an Agura here where you pick up two points or crash or or like Joe Roberts has here or just don't pick up point or you're only picking up two three four points at least you know I think his lowest point scoring in this little poor run is nine points that's okay that's okay if you're in a bad run here he's finished fourth he's almost gotten the podium at least do that and once you maybe maybe later on in the season you do find that form again and you can really push on and he's like I said he's got an eighteen point lead from having a slump. Can't do much better than that. Tough day for Aaron Kinnett again. I mean, he does have the win under his belt now, but these will still hurt. And yeah, I do like the way this championship's shaping up because, yeah, Garcia doesn't look like he has the outright pace, but he's not having any shockers. Whereas though, maybe Roberts and Agura look like they're having a little bit more pace on their good days. Maybe. C certainly Agura. They are obviously having the odd shocker. Should make it interesting, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And in Moto3... For me, this was the best race of the weekend, as it probably usually is, I want to say. I think I say, I say this after every race. Probably the best race of the weekend. We had a massive lead group for basically the whole race of about 11 guys. And when I say it like that, I mean, sometimes you do get lead groups that are maybe big, but 
bigger than that or whatever. But some guys drop off. This was just these guys, like any one of these could have won all the way to the end pretty much. So that was good. We'll talk about your top four in a second. But in that group, guys who really gave it a red hot go, who I was really impressed with, who normally maybe can get themselves in the group, but don't normally do much with that, were Joel Kelso and Nepa. I was, I was impressed with them. Just like, if you're going to fall to the back of the group anyway, at least spend the first half of the race scrapping at the front with them. Do everything you can to like get your elbows out, do everything you can to scrap. And I was like, it's tough for Joel Kelso there. I know he finished at the back of that group at the end, but like, I just want to see him having that, like, get your elbows out, lad. And really big improvement from him, I think. But look, in these sort of races, and you do hear sometimes people talk about, oh, look, it's just throw, toss a coin, whatever analogy you want to use, draw a card, you know, which one is going to win it. At the end of the day, your best four riders have finished the top four. So, like I said, you can say what you want about it, like it becomes a bit of a chance thing, but why do the same four guys finish at the top every time, you know? And I've got to say, Ortola starting to look very... I mean, we, we have seen this from him in the past. He is very good in these situations. Probably not as good as David Alonso, but that's twice this year where he's been in this situation and he's really come out on top in a really impressive way. He almost tried to break it about five laps ago, I want to say. He pulled about maybe just over half a second on everyone. Obviously, they pull you back. They're on the hangar straight. They're going to catch it. But he tried everything and he got, got what he deserved in the end. He got the win. But I thought everyone was good. Again, you could have picked any one to win this, but only win one of those three or four. Or maybe Elgato, not so much because um, it was never really looked like he was going to win it. But from the top three, Via, Ortola, and Alonso, maybe you could go with them three and go, any one of them three can win this. But the rest of them, no. The rest of them, the, the best three or four guys finish top three or four. And so, yeah, I thought it was a really great weekend to race. Silverstone, poor crowds again, right? Someone let me know what the ticket prices were like. I never even considered it this year because I've got other trips planned and stuff. So never really considered it. Um, so I didn't look at ticket prices and that. Let me know what they were like. Is this a ticket price thing? Is this like the UK is <laughs> ridiculously expensive living here at the moment? Like the inflation is crazy, all that sort of shit, right? So maybe people just don't have the money. Maybe you're prioritizing other trips like I am. I can't make every trip a MotoGP trip. I did Le Mans earlier in the year and I'm I'm thinking if I can scrape it together, I'm going to try and get to Valencia. But again, probably not. Probably not. I've got a trip up to Scotland coming in September. So that'll be expensive too. So is it a price thing for everyone? I know it was. For, like if I could afford it, I'd just go to Silverstone. It's down the road. It's like I, I would never have missed Phillip Island. Not that that was cheap. That was always expensive. But it was Phillip Island, so I always went. I don't feel about Silverstone the way I feel about Phillip Island. But I don't get like that with Silverstone because there's so many other opportunities to go. That's the other thing with Australia is there's not many other, other opportunities for you to just nip away for a Grand Prix. Like I went to Le Mans this year, it probably cost me the same as what it would have cost me to go to Silverstone. So, you know, that opportunity doesn't present itself in Australia. So you pretty much have to go to Philip Island. Tell me what it is that's stopping you, people in the UK, or people maybe if you are the kind of person who travels for Grand Prix and likes to travel and you've always maybe had the British Grand Prix on your list, but you're deciding not to go. What is it? Is, is it just the cost? Because I'm telling you, when you go there, I did it a couple of years ago. It's a great event. They put on a great event. The circuit's great. The facilities are excellent. Lots of food and drink options, albeit expensive, and plenty of decent ways to pick up somewhat affordable accommodation because you don't actually have to stay that close to the circuit. There's lots of towns surrounding it, and you can stay a little bit further away and just drive in, like, if you're willing to do it, half an hour to an hour. You know what I mean? You can stay a bit further away. Stay in London if you want. What is it that's keeping people away? Give me your thoughts in the comments. But the crowds were poor. You could see it on telly. You could see it on the telly. It looks grim. But yeah, I'd love to see this become. I mean, because I, what was the three day pass at some of these European Grand Prix? Is you can do it for like some of them are like a hundred euro to go for three days. I can't remember what I paid at Le Mans. I've got to make a video about it later in the year. I'll tell you. I've got all my footage recorded. I just can't be asked making it at the moment. Too busy. What is it that you know compared to? Is it more expensive than the other Grand Prix? Maybe slightly, just for tickets alone. And then, you know, the pound wrecks you if you're coming from other currencies. Definitely, it's bad enough when you're earning that currency. Um, so is that what's keeping people away? Let me know. We're not far off 700, no, 700 subscribers now. So can you push us there, please, guys? Come on, we're not far off. And yeah, we'll see you after Austria. We said that earlier, Austria. See you after that one.